Tonight on The Primary Source, my guest is longtime physics professor and principal partner at Tri-Seed Consultants, Dr. Sikazi Matingwa. Throughout his career, Dr. Matingwa has taught at numerous higher level institutions, including Harvard University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and North Carolina A&T State University. He has conducted groundbreaking research in the field of physics, being the first African-American to receive Robert R. Wilson Prize from the American Physical Society and has continually pushed for positive international relations and science research growth throughout the world. If you'd like to jump around our discussion, I've linked timestamps down in the description below, as well as links to all the different organizations, courses, and topics on tonight's podcast. To start things off, I wanted to ask you, where did your love of physics begin? Okay, well, first, I'd like to say thank you, Frank, for inviting me to this podcast. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. It should be a lot of fun. As far as science goes in general, I think, I mean, there was no one event, but when I was in elementary school, um, I had, my friends used to kid me quite a bit. Uh, my name now is Sekazi Mtingwa, but I changed my name. My original name was Michael Von Sawyer. So what happened was that in many of our textbooks and thing, articles that we read, you had these German scientists with these names like Von this and Von that. So they used to always call me Von Sawyer, the mad scientist. So that's how I sort of got, hey, you know, what is this science all about? So that's how I sort of got started. So when I went, that was elementary school. So when I got into high school early on, I sort of gravitated to working on a science project. And I had a science project in biology. Um, it, it, was a, it was a closed system. I'm looking in the future for astronauts and green algae um, being able to subsist uh, together in a closed system. And um, I went to the Georgia State Science Fair um, in the 10th grade, and I won first prize. And the, the important thing is that that was the first year that they integrated the Georgia State Science Fair. Because you have to remember when I was in school, it was during the Jim Crow South and school desegregation. So Around my 10th grade, they started integrating the schools and they had integrated science fair. So anyway, so one of the prizes that I won was a box full of paperback books, books on various fields of science and, and, and a lot of mathematics. And there were three that were on Einstein's theory of relative, special relativity. And it was from that that I really developed an interest in physics in particular. And so that's, that's how I got interested in science on the one hand in general as an elementary school student and later in high school um, pursuing physics. So it's safe to say that you've liked science your whole life. Yeah, essentially, yeah, as far back as I can remember, that's correct. And so going from high school to university, how did, how did you plan to continue your interest in science? Okay, so at the time I wanted to go to the absolute best university that I could think of um, to pursue physics. And so MIT was the name that I kept hearing. So I developed an interest in going to MIT. And um, in order for me to do that, I knew I had to do better in my, learn a lot of uh, more mathematics because in those days we did not have advanced placement. I mean, schools in general had it, but not uh, my particular high school. Again, um, you know, because of the, the, the um, Jim Crow era, we didn't really have as strong curriculum as other schools would have. So I basically had to get a calculus book and learn calculus on my own. And so I worked very hard and um, not only studying calculus, I subscribed to Scientific American. So every night before I went to bed, I, well, before I started my homework, I would read an article or part of an article from Scientific American. So I tried to, to, to sort of uh, beef up my science and my uh, mathematics skills so that I could uh, gain interest. So luckily I was admitted to MIT and that's where I went and, and double majored in physics and mathematics. And how did you build your skill set as you move forward in college? In high school, you read articles. You made sure to study calculus by yourself, which is quite a feat. Well, the important thing, I think, in all of that is self-study. Okay, And I think that um, my studying calculus on my own in high school, um, my reading articles from Scientific American, trying to get a good understanding of what the various um, um, exciting breakthroughs were in the sciences, um, I, I, you know, that's important, you know, the, 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 the self-study that you do. And that took me into college, actually, because um, what I would do, I wanted to double major in physics and math. 
And so I started studying courses over the summer. So even over the summertime, I would study one or two courses, usually two courses I would pass. What you would do, they have these things called essentially like advanced placement um, exams. So at MIT, I would uh, study, like the first one I think I tackled was linear algebra. So I studied it over the summer and came back in the fall before the school year started. I would take a, um, an exam and pass the exam and get credit for that. So I kept uh, self-study and I kept pushing on self-study. As a matter of fact, I never really liked lectures. It was hard for me to keep my attention focused in lectures. Um, so even though I took courses like everybody else in lectures, I found myself oftentimes my mind sort of drifting away from what the professor was talking about. Um, so in a sense, I self-studied the courses that I took as regular courses. So. So that's the important thing, just always bettering yourself, reading, you know, reading was always a big part of my, um, a, a big habit, big habit of mine. I wouldn't say a hobby, that that was sort of a part of me, because even in elementary school, um, the library, the local library had this special program where if you read 10 books, you could get a certificate. And so I got a certificate uh, every summer. So it, it's that kind of thing. I think that's been extremely important for me to self-study, uh, to keep pushing myself. Fill in the, the, you know, so fill in the blanks between classes and uh, move ahead that way. Just to jump on that reading habit, are there any books you recommend people read now? Any in the field of physics? Any in, uh, just personal interests? No, I think there are a lot of, um, right, right now, there are so many books um, that are out there um, in, 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 in physics and in many other things. You know, I studied literature, too. As a matter of fact, even as an old man, once I, you know, I, I retired from two universities. The first one was uh, North Carolina A&T. Um, I retired from that one after that. You know, I left there. I went to MIT. I retired again after that, and I started taking courses on Shakespeare. <laughs> in fact, I, I, well, I took several Shakespeare courses here. I'm in North Carolina now. We, we relocated to the Chapel Hill, Durham area. So um, they have Duke University has this continuing education uh, program. And so I started reading a lot of Shakespeare. And the interesting thing is I really enjoyed it this time as opposed to when you have to take them, you know, in university, when you're forced to take these. But now I had a chance to reflect and to really enjoy. So there are a lot of things out there. So I really don't necessarily want to suggest one book or another. It doesn't have to be in physics. It doesn't have to be in science. Just anything that strikes your, your, your fancy. And I try to impress upon the young people that to do the same thing, to read a lot. Always be in process of reading a book and not necessarily the book you are assigned by your school teacher. You know, pick another book. <laughs> would you say that reading has contributed not only to your success, but would you agree that it's contributed to the success of a lot of, a lot of other people in a similar sort of track as you? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, in fact, I was I'm in the process of writing a book, man. One of the persons that I highlight in the book said that he enjoyed uh, reading more than he did even the physics when he was growing up. So I think reading, you know, the, it, because reading is a, is a, is a form of, of um, you know, sort of entering another world. It stretches your mind, your imagination, but you, you, you enter something that is completely foreign to your everyday experience. So yeah, reading is just so important for that reason. And on the topic of stretching imagination, what were some of the areas of physics that you researched? What are some of the boundaries that you broke through your research? And how, what were the impacts of each that you felt like? How did you feel each study you did may have impacted physics? Okay, so um, there are two projects in particular that I really am happy that I was involved in during my research career. One was way back in the early 80s. I went to Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory as a postdoc, where then I stayed as one of the re staff research scientists. But there, I was lucky to be there during the time that Fermilab was uh, wanted to find the top quark. Okay, and, and just to sort of um, break it down a little bit, um, we know everything that we can reach out and touch is, you know, matter. And if you look down inside this, take a microscope or something, look inside a super microscope, you know it's composed of molecules and then molecules are composed of atoms. Inside the atoms you have electrons that are um, sort of a 
visual way that is generally depicted, these electrons are floating around um, the protons and neutrons in the nucleus. But then if you look inside the nucleus at the protons and neutrons, they themselves have inner structure. And so when you look at the smallest particles that you can sort of imagine composing the world, you talk about quarks. And so you have six of these things, um, top, down, um, you have charm, strange, um, up and down quarks. Um, but at that time, all were found except the top quark. And so Fermilab was in the process of searching for that. And I was lucky enough to be a part of the, of the group that built the accelerator systems that um, actually were used to discover the top quark. So I'm very proud of that and very happy to have been involved in sort of the discovery of one of these fundamental particles in nature. And then another thing um, I was involved in was um, something called, this was, that was more building accelerator systems. And the other thing was a theoretical problem, which was called intra-beam scattering. Um, we know that beams travel around accelerators in bunches, and you have many of the same kind of a particle. Like at Fermilab, we had protons flying around the accelerator, all with the same charge, the positive charge. And we know that positive charge particles repel each other. So you, in your accelerator system, you're trying to keep all of these things together who don't like each other, in a sense. And so that's one phenomenon that's called intra-beam scattering. So these particles, even though they're traveling together, they're bouncing all around, you know, off of each other. It's like we have a bunch of people traveling in a marathon at the beginning. If they're too close, everybody will be falling all over each other. And so you would imagine that the group will disperse. So that's what happens in these proton beams, is that the beam gets larger. And the same thing for antiproton beams. An antiproton has negative charge. And so Fermilab had to use antiproton beams as well. And um, so we wanted to understand the, the, you know, the growth of these beams due to intra-beam scattering. And so we solved that problem. I worked with uh, Professor James Bjorkane, who went to Stanford, and he's now retired from there. Um, and then as an independent uh, person who worked on, a, a person who worked on it independently from, from Germany, uh, named Anton Pavinsky. So James Bjorkane and me here, and Anton Pavinsky there. In, in, at Daisy in Hamburg, Germany, and for our work, that's why we received this, um, this um, 2017 uh, Robert R. Wilson Prize from the American Physical Society. And one thing I might say about that award, um, the situation relative to African Americans and awards, unfortunately, um, no African American had ever won a, a, a one of the research prizes from the American Physical Society. Um, the, the, American, the APS, the American Physical Society, gives prizes, which are the top awards in each of the research divisions. They also have a variety of things they call awards, but their top honors are called prizes. And so I was the first African American to receive any prize. And that's something that I would like to see changed in the near future. So right now, no, I'm, I, I don't want to be the only one. <laughs> Do you see in modern day that the education for students who want to follow your path is becoming more available to them? No, I think so. I think so. And that's one of the things I've devoted part of my career is to try to make that happen. Okay, but to finish answering your question, so those are the two research things that I am most proud of, you know, helping to discover the top court and this research on intra-beam scattering. Um, so that's my research in uh, what you would call high energy and accelerator physics. But one of the things I've done in my career was to move into different areas. Um, another area I have, I've worked in is nuclear energy policy. As you know, we have about 100 nuclear reactors supplying electricity, roughly 20% of our electricity around the country. And so what you do is to use the fuel in these reactors. And when you need to take the fuel out, you have to store them generally on site for some short period of time. And once the radioactivity dies down to a certain point, you want to try to move them into some type of interim storage. Um, but eventually, this material needs to go to some permanent storage, which is called a geologic depository. And that's the big fight, for instance, over Yucca Mountain. You know, that was chosen by the government by law to be the repository. However, um, the people there in Nevada fought against it. So it's still sort of uh, in limbo. 
But my attitude is that if we're going to have nuclear reactors, nuclear power, we have to make the whole reactor cycle, the nuclear fuel cycle, a safe one. And that's how I got involved in nuclear energy policy. And one thing I did, um, over the years, the number of students pursuing degrees had sort of fallen down dras drastically. And a few years ago, um, President Clinton appointed this thing called the Nuclear Energy Research Advisory Committee, which actually pointed the path of investing in, in university in nuclear science and technology. And, 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 the, and the U.S. did that. Numbers started rising. And then the Department of Energy had this idea, well, things are going so well now, we can just pull the money back out again and not fund it. So that alarmed me as well as some other people. So anyway, I embarked upon a, 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 a study for the American Physical Society um, looking at the readiness of the nuclear workforce for 21st century challenges. And from that report, we were able to study in depth the university funding and its effects. And based upon that, it helped to influence DOE to rethink its policy and it started investing something like 20% of its um, fuel cycle research in university programs. And for that work, I received the um, 2015 Distinguished Service Award from the American Nuclear Society. So that's something else that I, I've been very proud of. And most recently, um, in 2016, I was appointed um, an administrative judge with the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So we adjudicate cases involving disputes over reactor licenses. So if a company wants to build a reactor, um, they have to publish their license application in something called the Federal Registry. And the public has 60 days to file um, in petitions against it, to make it known that they don't like it or whatever the complaints they have. And so anyway, if that all works out, there's some procedural steps that they must go through. But eventually, um, those cases are decided by panels of three judges, three federal administrative judges. So I've been doing that, and it's been another sort of an eye-opening experience for me. Having such a strong uh, foundation in nuclear physics and nuclear science, what do you foresee for the industry in the next couple of years? How do you see it developing? Um, you know, things, are, things go up and down, up and down. But I think the most critical thing will be that whole question nagging question of the geologic repository. What are we going to do with all of the nuclear fuel that's been used in reactors and it's just sitting around the country in temporary and interim storage? I mean, what do we do with it? And um, if you can't solve that problem, I don't really see a great future for nuclear energy. If you solve that problem, then I think things could turn around. But my whole goal is to just ensure that whatever happens, that um, we make it as safe as possible. But I think that's the critical thing, you know, the, the, the permanent disposal of the used fuel. That's the critical issue. What do you feel that there are any solutions to that problem as of now, or is it well, currently? Right now we don't have a solution. I mean, the solution, okay, there is a solution, but it's not being politically pursued, and that is Yucca Mountain. Okay, so if you take Yucca Mountain off the table, um, President Obama had this blue ribbon commission on America's nuclear future, which um, studied, you know, how do we get a geologic repository? And out of that commission, um, it was proposed. And of course, people had said this previously, it should be consent based siting. So rather than forcing a repository on a particular geographic location, it's best to identify what it takes to have a repository, what would be the benefits to the local community and then let communities come forward and say, hey, we want it. Okay, so that's the consent-based approach. And I think that's the way that the country should go ahead. But so far, nothing much has happened along those lines. What, what are your thoughts on thorium reactors? Um, well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a thought. I had a good friend of mine. Unfortunately, he passed away, one of the MIT professors who did a lot of work on thorium reactors. Um, but um, it, it's something that's out there. I mean, it, it could be pursued. I have nothing plus or minus about it. I don't have anything for or against it, but that's another idea that's out there. But there are so many ideas that are out there. Many, many ideas. And, and now just to zoom out, what do you see for the future of physics as a whole? I mean, they recently got a photo of a black hole. Where, where do you see the field oh, going? Exciting. Um, I think physics is, is strong. It's still exciting. I mean, these, you know, over the last um, 
five years or so, we've had you know the, you know, the, the recent, as you say, uh, photo of the black hole. Um, um, we had the you know discovery of gravitational waves. I mean, that's something that we've been looking for 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 almost for almost a hundred years. I mean, this is something that Einstein predicted way back you know in the early 1900s, 1915, of course, was the general theory of relativity. And that's what that comes out of. And when I was a graduate student, people talked about gravitational waves. People over the past have said, we've seen gravitational waves only to be this, you know, <laughs> argued against. People were able to shoot it down. Um, but now, I mean, unequivocally around the world, people are seeing gravitational waves. Really exciting. Black hole astrophysics, really exciting. You know, we are really trying to understand how we got here as a universe. Extremely exciting. Why do we have more seeming protons than antiprotons. You know, if a particle and its antiparticle meet, they basically annihilate each other. So the universe survives, and we have this abundance of particles over antiparticles. How did that happen? Because the, the theorists seem to indicate that when, you know, the particles and antiparticles were originally created, they were in, created in equal numbers. So what is it about the universe that favored more things going from antiparticle to particle than particle to antiparticle. These are all basic fundamental questions that are exciting. Um, many of the people who came up, in, like I did in high energy particle physics, are now doing astro, what's called astroparticle physics. They are using the philosophy of what they know and knowledge of particles at the elementary level to understand what's going on in the universe. Because we know the universe is driven by these particles. So it's exciting, physics is exciting. Many areas of physics, That's, I'm sort of in a way uh, prejudiced toward my own area, but um, there are so many areas that are super exciting. I mean, something I've been involved in in recent times, advocating um, these uh, advanced light sources like at Brookhaven and other national laboratories. So much exciting physics, biology, and paleontology. So much exciting work is coming out of those light sources. So science is fine, but the question is funding it. Unfortunately, in my area, in dealing with particle physics, accelerators are multi-billion dollar instrument. And to, to go to the next level, it takes more and more billions of dollars. So that's the challenge, how to fund these big mega pieces of equipment. And so the international community in recent times have started pooling resources. And so that's the way we've tried to do it so far, and um, we need to push on that. But, um, you know, there's this tension of politicians pulling away from funding for the science. So that's our biggest challenge, keeping the funding going. Yeah, and, and just to jump on that point, you've worked on a lot of these initiatives to help that, such as LAAMP and INCREASE. Could you right. describe some of these organizations and your experiences with them? Right. Okay, so um, well, increase. Okay, let me tell you, increase is domestic, it's national, and the lamp is an international project. Okay, so increase is a group that's um, sort of grounded at Hampton University in the, and, and at um, Brookhaven National Laboratory. That's how it grew out of uh, out of those institutions, as well as the University of Puerto Rico, um, Rio Piedras campus. Um, and the idea there is to open up opportunities to minority-serving institutions at our national laboratories. And minority-serving, I mean the Latin, uh, Latino-serving, African-American-serving, and Native American-serving institutions. So we periodically put on workshops once or twice a year at the various facilities, and we bring faculty and a few students and we try to connect them with the researchers and with the infrastructures there. And we've been quite successful in making a lot of really great connections. So that's the INCREASE. And INCREASE is the acronym of a very long thing. Interdisciplinary Consortium for Research and Educational Access in Science and Engineering. <laughs> so, so we call it INCREASE for sure. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> now the LAMP project um, is, is, is light sources, it's the acronym for light sources for Africa, the Americas, Asia, and Middle East project. And what we try to do is to go into mainly developing countries and identify researchers whose work could be enhanced by accessing one of these light sources that I mentioned, these advanced light sources. Um, these 
advanced light sources typically are, are electron accelerated, much smaller than the machines we deal in in my profession of high energy physics. But these are um, light sources uh, several hundred um, meters in, in circumference. You have electron beams that go around. And when you wiggle the electron beam, it gives off intense bursts of X-rays. The nice thing is that you can set up experimental stations um, that use these X-rays, and you can wiggle the beam at points all around the accelerator. So you could have 50, 60, 70 experiments going on at the same time, and it's done in biology, chemistry, material science. I mean, people are able to perform X-ray analysis of, of ancient bones, you know, paleontology. Um, people can study artwork. Um, and one interesting sort of a very interesting case is um, people have for years argued whether or not Picasso used house paint in addition to his professional paint. So scientists scrape off a little uh, micro piece of a painting in the art museum in Chicago and to study it in a light source, probably the advanced light source there outside of Chicago um, at Argonne National Laboratory. I don't remember what, but I suspect that's where it was. But in any event, they were able to, um, to, to, to determine by using these x-rays that Picasso indeed did use house paint in addition to his sort of professional paint in his work. So there are a lot of things going on with these light sources. So that's why um, I have tried to advocate this, these things around the world. And so this LAMP project, what we do is to send faculty, student teams to light sources for training for two months. And so you have a faculty and a PhD student who will go for two months, um, like at Brookhaven's um, light source. And um, from that, we are hoping to build up the number of researchers who have expertise using these devices, since they are so important. And one nice thing about these devices, for some research, you can actually mail your samples in to collaborators, so you don't have to physically go there. And they can take the data for you, and you do your data analysis online. So these light sources are very powerful. Unfortunately, Africa does not have one anywhere. It's the only habitable continent. I say habitable because Antarctica doesn't have one either. But of course, it doesn't have very many people, so that doesn't count. But among the habitable continents, Africa is the only one that does not have a light source. So that's why I've been involved in trying to help um, um, spread the word about light sources in Africa. And we formed a group called the African Light Source. And I serve as deputy director, deputy chair of the steering committee. Um, with the, the chair of the steering committee is a Professor Simon Connell from the University of Johannesburg. So we um, we work together. Two of us with our steering committee, executive steering committee, work to try to bring a light source to Africa. So that's that's my involvement with these um, light sources. You know, we, we try to identify scientists. So where are they? They are in Africa. When I say the Americas, I mean we identify people in Mexico and, and the Caribbean. Um, I mean, for instance, we've sent people from the University of the West Indies to, to the light source at Brookhaven. Um, we are now, this year, we'll be sending people from the University of the West Indies, not West Indies, but, the, but um, yeah, the University of the West Indies campus in Jamaica will be going to light sources. And also Venezuela, we have people in Southeast Asia who will be going, uh, one person from Thailand, another person from the Philippines. Um, we have people coming from various countries in Africa, Cameroon, Benin. So we're identifying people. So we hope to have 30 people this year spending um, two months at the Light Sources and Training. So that's been the thing that I've been doing with Increase. You were asking about what, uh, what Increase was about. So on the national level, that's what I've done. On the international level, the LAMP project. What do you see the impact of these globally? I mean, it's obviously going to have a positive one. How do you see this changing the way research is done across the world as we move forward? Well, I think the light sources in particular, I call them advanced light sources um, to distinguish from light bulbs in your house, which <laughs> so are just light sources. But these advanced light sources are really just revolutionizing science because, I mean, you, as I said, I mean, you have, they are tunable. I mean, the wavelength that you use it can be adapted to whatever project you have in hand. So you can tune them from, you know, people do ultraviolet radiation um, with, the, with these light sources to, to perform experiments. They use various wavelengths of x-rays. Um, and so you are, and the intensity of these things, I mean, the amount of data you get in a short period of time 
which is why you don't need much time on these. What you do, you have to write a proposal saying what you want to do, how much beam time you need, and typically you will go only for a few days, take your data, and then you go back to your institution and spend probably the next year analyzing it. Um, so they are changing the way we collaborate on physics. Um, because now, you know, you can go to a light source and it's a very, very rich academic community now. You, you interface with people from other disciplines. Um, so you can build collaborations that way across disciplines. Um, so that's the big thing. I mean, these things are facilitating sort of the future of science, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, um, and, 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 you know, collaborative work. Collaboration is the game nowadays in, in, in the science. So you have to learn to work together now. If you had any advice for people who wanted to do beamline research and pursue a similar career as you, mm -hmm. what skills would you recommend they learn? Are there any learning resources you would say they should check out? Any well, specific think, skills? Yeah, I think the thing is being able to work with other people. I think that's the most important skill because people who want to do this, of course they need to know the physics, right? They need to know the biology or chemistry or whatever it is they're doing. So that part is great. But you have to also be able to work. You have to be able to collaborate. So that takes a skill. So I want, so people need to understand how to collaborate. You have to have the skill of interacting with different people, different countries, different genders, right? We live in the Me Too movement and all too often, women are sort of pushed out of science because they want to avoid certain types of interactions. Um, I mean, I've had some close friends who've left research facilities because uh, men acted inappropriately to them, and that's just a complete waste of talent, disrespect of humanity. Uh, so we need to do that. We need to learn how to work together, to be mindful of gender differences, be mindful of people's personal space, um, and just be a decent person. <laughs> learn to be decent, the skill to be decent. Um, another skill that's important is to learn administrative skill because now, you know, we have so many research groups um, and they tend to oftentimes come under groups and you need to learn how to administratively work. And scientists are not taught administrative skills when we come up. We're not like business majors where you're taught management skills. So somehow you need to develop those kinds of management skills that you can manage these projects. And oftentimes you will be managing big multi-million or multi-billion dollar projects. So management skills are very important. As you've grown, there are likely to become successes and, and failures in your career. What were some of the things you wish you knew before starting your lengthy and impactful career? Yeah, before I started my career, I think the thing that would have helped me the most um, since nowadays I'm traveling constantly. If I had learned or started learning foreign languages well young, for instance, I took um, French, uh, French in high school. I wish I had taken it more seriously and become worked hard to become fluent in French. You know, I had excellent teachers um, teaching us languages, but you know, students don't really take things seriously. I, you know, I, I developed a skill over the years since I started studying other languages. Russian, I know the most. Um, and one of the ways I help myself to become fluent is to just stand in front of the mirror and just talk to myself. <laughs> Repeat the same thing. But that's how you learn languages, repetition. Just stand in front of the mirror and just say the same thing over again, over and over again. Um, and it becomes, you, you learn to sort of say it without thinking so much about it. So languages are something that I wish I would have spent more time um, since high school, I've learned enough to be able to survive in Spanish, Italian, French, um, and, and of course, Russian, I know the best. But learn, knowing the, the um, Latin languages is also gives you insight into, say, Portuguese. And I have to attend a conference in, in uh, an island, off, island nation off the west coast of Africa in another month called Sao Tome at Principe. And uh, they speak Portuguese there. So that even though I can't speak Portuguese, I, amazingly, I can read a lot of it because it's so much like Italian and French and Spanish. Um, the problem is when they speak, it doesn't sound like any of those languages. <laughs> I'm at a loss. <laughs>
But anyway, I, since I've been traveling so much internationally nowadays, and in, in fact, a lot in Africa, you know, Africa has a lot of French and Portuguese, Port, Portuguese speaking uh, countries. Um, I find that my uh, French has helped me tremendously there. And in the Caribbean traveling, of course, the Spanish helps quite a bit. How did you teach yourself these languages? Did you use any digital resources, any books? Like, did you, or did you just pick uh, it up as you talk to people? Uh, all of the above, right. Well, Russian, I, I took three years in undergraduate school. So that one I had a good head up on. But the other ones, I basically just got a textbook. Um, and then you had the digital packages. I don't want to advertise for one country over another, one company over another, so I won't tell you which which ones I use. But there are a lot of these digital packages. Some of them are, in fact, free. And you just, they give you phrases and pictures and vocabulary, and you just, uh, um, you just work on it. Then I get these books. Um, it's a popular one that says, say it in French, say it in, in Spanish, say it in Italian. And what they would do would give you very useful expressions like, where is the train station? <laughs> How much does this cost? You know, just basic expressions um, that you just learn and you say them to yourself over and over again. And uh, they become sort of a part of you. So that's sort of the way I do it. But, you know, when you start learning languages, you, you understand the structure of the languages and you know what to go after. And in particular for the um, Latin type languages like the French, Spanish, the Italian. Um, you know, the verb conjugations are all essentially the same. Uh, so you, you, you know exactly how to go after things. And one final question for you tonight, Dr. Matingua, and it's a bit of a doozy. How would you define personal success? Okay, so to me, success means happiness and good health. Right. I mean, to me, if you are happy with what you've done, you've done, and you've been able to exercise and eat well and uh, maintain good health, I think you've been highly successful. Um, I don't want to measure success in terms of awards or in terms of um, salary, titles, all of these kinds of things. But to me, the most important thing is, is to be happy with what you've done. And if you have, I think you've been successful. I mean, I could have been a rich person. I have friends of mine who came, went to school with me, and many of them went to Wall Street and multimillionaires now. And I wish them well, um, because, but that was not what I, that was not my bent. So money is not the important thing. If you're happy with making a lot of money, then that's great. But if you're happy doing other things, that's also great. So to me, happy and good health is the most important. That's a really beautiful answer. And thank you for your time tonight, Dr. Matingo. It was really amazing to have you on the podcast. Oh, and thank you. And best of luck to you as you pursue your career. Thank you so much. And to all you listeners at home, thank you for your time as well. If you'd like to check out the material we've discussed, it's down below in the description. If you could, please like and subscribe and share this video and comment down below your favorite part of this podcast. Have a wonderful night, and I'll see you next month.